Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Beyond Fulfillment Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Goulis, and this week, my guest is the founder and the CEO of Valeroo, Nick Schrock. Welcome, Nick. Hey, David. How's it going? Going great. Going great. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for having me. I know we've been talking about it for a while. So. Yeah, yeah. Glad we could uh, finally connect. Um, if you would, for everyone, could you tell us what Valeroo is and how it came to be? Yeah, um, of course. So Valeroo is a, a staffing company that uh, sources people in the Philippines, Belize, Central America, uh, specifically for supply chain companies. So uh, my background is uh, I started Valeroo about five years ago. And before that, I was working at, uh, at the time, a small San Diego startup called what is now Flock Freight. Um, it was just, you know, uh, maybe a dozen of us in the back room of a carrier that the CEO also ran, just trying to figure out how to 10x a company year over year without 10xing our payroll. And so naturally, we looked at outsourcing. Um, I built a lot of those early offshore teams and after a few years with them kind of realized like, hey, this is a unique talent I've developed, right? Uh, helping scale logistics businesses through the help of uh, more of, uh, cost effective labor and kind of branched off and started doing it for other peoples. So um, more, I guess, tactically, we, we help brokerages, carriers, freight forwarders, find um, entry to mid-level staff. So think dispatchers, carrier sales, operators, accounting folks, um, do the work that typically US um, employees don't wanna do, or um, it's just too cost prohibitive for, to hire them to do it. Okay. So now in those early days, how did you get involved with developing offshore teams? Is that something you just had to jump in and, and figure out how to do? Uh, you mean at my, uh, at Flock, you're saying? Yeah. yeah. So I was a broker, right? I was slinging for, I was just making phone calls every single day. And um, I, our, our VP of sales approached me at the time, asked me if I would take a crack at it. Cause I'm, I'm at heart, a data guy. I was running when you're small, you do everything. I was a broker, but I was also running all of our um, data analytics for the sales team, right? Just running our numbers, making sure we're efficient. And so he asked me to take a crack at it. So we started with just lead generation. It fit really much into sales. So, hey, all our sales reps are on the floor are making 60 to 100 calls a day. How do we 10x that number without just hiring 10 more salespeople? And so that's where we started, right? And just calling it, figuring out what type of freight do they have? Are they, who are they, how are they moving it today? How often are they moving freight? kind of doing those exploratory calls so that our sales reps can just be more efficient. We're now only talking to decision makers. We're talking about, uh, we're having scheduled calls, things like that. So that was our, my first forte into, um, into outsourcing was with them. And it was kind of, I, it's pure luck, right? I didn't, I wasn't slotted for this. I didn't have any background. I was just, um, when you're in a startup, you just, you help wherever you can, right? We don't have someone for every specific task. And um, if you do a good job of that, good things will happen to you. Okay. So before long, you, you went out on your own and you realized this was a unique niche. And then what what made you finally to start decide to start what is, what's now Valeroo? So I, 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 um, there's some funny stories in here. So I knew I wanted to run my own company at some point. It's like, it was a passion for mine. It's like, um, my wife will yell at me because at one point we bought, I bought a giant, we still have the freezer, which is great, but I have tons of, we had like, uh, 50 pounds of acai. I'm like, Oh, acai, I'll be able to do these different things and sell it into here. And then we have all these different products around of me just kind of MVPing minimal, like just trying to see what I like, what would work, what I could possibly sell. And um, as Flock grew, you know, the, uh, it was, things were changing and I was like, you know what? It's like, um, I think it's a, a good time for me to move on. And I wasn't sure that outsourcing was it, but it was just time to, time to take the leap and try it, try entrepreneurship and kind of self-funding. So um, wife and I made the decision. So sold our house, sold our car, kind of moved into a small little 
place in a, a different part of town and kind of just gritted it out for the first year until we actually were able to kind of become profitable and start growing. Okay. So those early days too, like the first year, right? Where you mm -hmm. have this talent, you're familiar with how it works, but you've, you've got, like you said, right? You really took the leap and went all in. What was it like getting customers and, and managing profitability and managing expenses, you know, when you're brand new at that? Um, great question. So it's not fun, right? Like the first year is just very, very tough, right? And this is like... um. I think Elon Musk says running a business is like chewing glass and staring into the abyss. That's very much what it feels like, especially early on. And it's like, you're just trying, um, you're trying 10 things and watching 12 things fail. Um, <laughs> but, and eventually you, you try enough things and you run enough tests that something works. Right. And then you go from there. So um, what we did is it's just like in the beginning, you're just, uh, basic, what we did to be successful, trying to give your listeners some value and some actual tactical stuff is we were basically offering, just putting ridiculous guarantees on things. It's like, we'll work for free for 60 days. If it doesn't work out, then there. And just trying all these different things to get your foot in the door. Because at the time it's like, yeah, now we have multiple offices in different countries, hundreds of employees we're naturally reputable just by our size and our processes that we have in place. But when we got started, it's, it's me and my background is my, my living room. Right. And so it's harder to convince people to give you a shot and get your foot in the door. So we had an absurd amount of outreach. So we just put in the work, tons of cold calls, tons of emails, tons of LinkedIn connections, trying to network with whoever we could. And then on a vet, on what we were offering, it's like, yes, we're offering staffing and there's a lot of value in that. But we tried to put together offers that were very difficult to refuse. It's like putting all of the risk on our end where, because um, I know once we get in, it's like the value we can drive is exponential and we're going to be able to grow with them and drive the value. But um, I was like, hey, we'll, we won't bill you for the first 60 days. We'll double your staffing needs. Like on top of that, I'll come into your office and I'll document all your SOPs and all these different things. And um, it's just what you have to do early on to drive as much value as possible. And, uh, but that's also expensive, just kind of different things we tried and it, it ended up working out and we go from there. And was there so, like a certain inflection point? Because like you said, startup, very humble beginnings and now multiple offices, different countries, hundreds of employees. Was there, was there a certain inflection point where things really started to take off? I'd say there was there was a few. Um, one was about 10 months in when we were break even. That was like a miraculous day. We weren't burning our own money anymore. Um, was pretty fantastic. Um, but and then maybe like two years in, we really started to like compound. And I don't know what that really key was, but honestly, I, I feel like we're kind of in that now. We haven't changed anything. Like, yeah, we have, an, we opened another office in Belize, which is uh, fantastic and fun, but it's just our, just our customer retention is so sticky and fun. So once we're with customers, we're, we're just growing with them. They love our products. So we're branching into different departments, but I don't know. It's like, sometimes you feel a point in your company and it just feels good. You're onboarding, you know, um, a dozen customers a month. You're just moving and rolling and it feels like we're kind of there. So uh, I'll let you know if six months, if it's really an inflection point, but it, it feels, it feels fun. It feels like the, where you're just compounding month over month. It's a, it is fun. It is fun. All right. And, you know, you mentioned the, like, once you get in there, the, you're very sticky with the customers. What do you think's the, like, what are some of the biggest benefits that companies realize once they work with you and they have access to your, your talent solutions? Yeah, I think it's either, um, we have two, two things people realize. One is if they haven't outsourced before, they, they realize it's not what they meaning the English is fantastic. You can barely tell someone has an accent. It's just there. And then the talent is more than you expect. 
it's not just people tracking and tracing a load. It's not just someone that can make take customers' phone calls and type it into a computer. It's very similar to what you experience with a U.S. hire. People can problem solve. People can figure things out. People can create the SOPs that you don't have. And um, once people realize that, they also realize that the opportunities are greater than they initially thought. A lot of times we start out with maybe a third shift or um, a track and trace or something that people, it's hard for them to fill locally. But once they realize that uh, there's a very high level of talent, it, it opens up a lot of doors. And then the other, the other one is customer has outsourced before. And they've had the previous experience I just described where it's like, maybe the English isn't good. They're dealing with a company that doesn't treat the people the best. So once they work with us and they realize they have a, 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 a great partner that treats the people the way they want, that mirrors their culture and um, kind of being people first. Um, and then they're like, oh, this is what we, what we wanted all along and we grow from there. Okay. And uh, you bring up another uh, point too. I, I read an article that uh, you were featured in, in Freight Waves. And one of the quotes there too was in terms of company culture being the number one driver of productivity, something, something that effect. Can you expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, I, I'm just a big believer. It's like you're spending, and it's a little bit exaggerated, but you spend a third of your life working. I think you should enjoy who you do it with and who you do it for. So, um, and then being set up for success. So we've all been in jobs where we just feel like we're almost set up to fail, right? And that's true in outsourcing. So not only it's like, sure, we, we pay people right. We pay people 50 to 100% more than um, our peers in our industry. But uh, we sure we do all the charity events, meet and greets, pizza parties, all that good stuff. But I think a huge part that people don't, talk about in culture is just being given the tools to be a rock star at your job. These are your expectations. Here's coaching to be able to meet those expectations. Here's tracking measures to make sure you're able to execute on what you're expected to do. And no one likes to be bad at their job or fail. So we spend a ton of time, a ton of money, a ton of effort in putting our reps in a place to where they can excel and be rock stars. And in turn, that leads to a great culture. Because when, if you feel like you're amazing and you're doing a good job, you're gonna be happy. And then, and it's just, uh, it's just circles around the whole company. I think it, it does drive exponential productivity within a company. Okay. And specifically with the Philippines, right? Philippines and then Belize, like yep. why, why are those markets advantageous for, for these offshore, these, these outsourced positions rather than maybe some of the other, other markets out there? Yeah. And there's tons of good outsourcing around the country, right? You have um, uh, like worldwide, the number one and number two countries is India and the Philippines, um, just primarily for the the level of English, um, the the lack of for the Philippines specifically, lack of accents, college education level. We didn't go with India just because it's um, uh, for for customer facing roles. They were a British territory for a long time, so it has a little bit of a an odd accent to Americans. So we didn't go down that path. Um, and but comparing Philippines to some of the South American and Central American companies, there's just a much larger talent, right? 60 per, I'd say 90% of the country speaks English. And I'd say 60% is actually fluent in how we're discussing today, um, which just is, gives us an immense population to draw from. Um, so much so that in the Philippines, for example, we do not hire people unless they're coming in with logistic experience meaning they've worked for a brokerage, they've worked for a carrier, they've done this type of work in the past. Um, I don't know about you, but teaching somebody what a BOL is, is a long road to being an effective operations <laughs> rep. So if we can skip all that and get someone with experience, it, it helps us out quite a bit. Got it. Um, now, also, you, you know, you're five years in and you've grown considerably in those five years. What's it been like managing that growth as you really started to scale and you went from just starting up to now, now you're at hundreds of employees? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, fun question. I don't know if anybody's asked me this before. Um, early on, it's just, it's do things that don't scale is the epitome of, of being a small business. It's like, don't try to delegate everything. Don't try to put process, just do it, just execute, get it out the door, get the product released. It doesn't matter if it should take you an hour, but you just overwork to get it and make everything work now is, is very much the opposite. It's like, Hey, how can we put people in place to be successful? Um, how can we leverage our size? How can we uh, put processes around things and empower strong? So I'd say right now it's like, um, at least I'm answering this from a personal perspective. It's like in the beginning, as like, I was working, right. I was just doing things. I was a, a contributor and now it's how, how do we put people in places and find rock stars and promote rock stars into, into more senior positions so that way they can execute and they can be the people that are actually um, building what is valor, right, in the processes we do. So both are fun, and I'm sure it'll change again once, in, once we hit the 10-year mark and we have thousands of employees. I'm sure that's going to be a whole different monster in the way we manage, so... And with everything you've done in this this first five years, what's been the most rewarding part of of your business journey? Um, that's a that's a fun question too. I would say the most rewarding is probably seeing um, and much more. This happens in the U.S. too, but for whatever reason, it's more rewarding when it happens in other countries. Is seeing seeing our employees and reps, just the success they're having and the change in their lives, right? Whether it's our um, nonprofit stuff with our Valor Cares division or employees posting about a house they just built or a new car they just got. And um, that stuff's just super fun for me. It's like what we've built at Valor is enabling all of that stuff. And it's not something you really think about when you start a business, you know, when you first start, you think of personal freedom and kind of selfishness, right? It's like, oh, I won't have a boss. I'll be able to do all this fun stuff. And that is great. But the what's more rewarding than that is kind of the impact you have on the employees. And it's just, just as outsourcing 10 X is what you can do in the U S with hiring. The reward is also that because you can drive more change at a third, the cost you can in the U S. Yeah. And another interesting thing I saw on your LinkedIn was, um, I think it was last year you had a Valeroo has got talent night. Oh yeah. That's how, so this is something that I, um, I almost vetoed cause I thought it was just too cheesy. We had our, our annual, um, just get together Christmas party, right. Company gets together. We all just celebrate reps of the year, managers of the year, things like that. Um, and then they were in, Filipinos love to sing, love to dance, love to do. It's just in the culture. And so everyone's pushing me for like a Valru's Got Talent. That seems, I'm imagining like a U.S. office party of everyone trying to sing and it just being awful. But no, we have world-class singers in our, in our Filipino office. So, um, and, and I'm not exaggerating, literally ex-professional musicians um dancers like this and it, it blew us away so um i know we were talking with dooner i need to get back to him because that important this is uh they st uh, they're all still with us so i need to we, we need to do some guest appearances for you and for those guys so okay good deal and uh so what's next with everything you've built and now like you said you're you're, you're continuing to scale so what's next throughout 2024 for valeru I'd say that our biggest change is we opened our um, Belize office in December of 23. So to, to timestamp the podcast, like what we're three months after that, be down there and again in a couple of weeks. Um, main reason for that is bilingual, right? Belize is a country right outside of Mexico. Um, they're English first. So English is their first language. 100% of the country speaks English. Um, but the Philippines is not great at Spanish. They just aren't. It's just not one of the primary languages. Uh, so going down there, setting up the office, kind of figuring it all out, and then filling that office is kind of our main thing. So I'd say that's our our biggest change. But other than that, it's kind of more the same. Just continue to serve people um, 
a great service and continue to support our customers and grow. All right. And if people want to get in touch, learn more about the solutions that you offer, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah. So um, two way, you can obviously just go to our website, valaroo.com. I think it's spelled right behind me. Um, but also if you have any direct questions, want to chat with me on just, uh, we mostly talk about business stuff and I think you can tell I, I enjoy on the business, the startup, the growing portion. Um, but reach out to me directly. My email is nick at valaroo.com N I C K at valaroo.com. So happy to answer questions, kind of get you in touch with the right people. If you're curious about our product and we can go from there. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, Nick. We'll put his contact info in the show notes. And that's all the time we have for now. We will see you next time. Mm -hmm.